too much time on things like validity and reliability. We'll talk a little bit about it just because we're talking about measurement, but let's just make sure everybody's on the same page when we're talking about this. And I like these, uh, uh, these little targets to explain this. Um, if the actual construct we're trying to measure is the bullseye, then um, what we can start with down here is an example that's both reliable and valid in that lower right-hand corner. In other words, the same patient may, may complete the same scale several times, but if our tool is both reliable and valid, it may not give us exactly the same score, but they should all be pretty tightly bunched. They should all be around that bullseye. Moving to the left, what we have here is a tool that is, again, clearly reliable. So I, have the, I give the patient the same scale several times, and they fill it all out. They're always getting scores that are fairly tightly bunched, but if it's not valid, it's missing the mark. It's not tapping the construct that we really want it to tap into. Up on the top right, you can see how we've got a scale here that's valid but not reliable. Okay. Now this is sort of a bit of a wishy-washy comment because um, many people will say a scale can't be valid without being reliable. But nonetheless, you get the idea. If I was to take the average of all these scores, then the average would, would probably put me right somewhere in the center. But in no situation other than maybe one, did I actually tap the construct I wanted to tap. So the scores were all over the place on this one. Okay. And then, of course, on the top left, it's missed the mark, plus the scores are all over, so it's unreliable and it's not valid. Okay. So we'll just keep those terms in mind as we go forward. Um, as I say, most people would say that um, a scale can be reliable without being valid, but it can't be valid without being reliable. Okay. So we'll just keep those in mind as we go forward. I know most of you uh, young students are familiar with this. So if I was to talk about that, um, what measurement properties are important for pain assessment? If we think about the reasons that we want to measure pain, is reliability, uh, uh, rely, uh, let me try one more time, reliability, I feel like I need one more coffee, is reliability important? Certainly if we're going to be losing this to cha track change over time, right, then it should be reasonably reliable. When we talk about validity, I've already said that we probably can't establish what's called criterion-related validity, which is a gold standard-related validity. But there are other kinds of validity that we can establish. And as we go and talk about some of the different scales today, we'll talk about the different types of validity that these scales should be able to exhibit. Um, I'm not going to answer these questions right now. We are going to talk about them as we go on today, but let's, we'll put them out there for now for you to think about. Are we better off with one tool that measures several domains at once? or several different tools that each measure a single domain. I'll talk about that as we go. How many is too many? Part of what you'll, at, at some point during the day today, you're going to go, man, how many scales am I giving these, these patients? We'll talk about that as well. At the end of the day, we're going to wrap it up and, and we're going to come up with a sort of base toolbox that I think you can use clinically. Uh, when and how should they be administered? This is especially important when we start talking about the cognitive and psychologically oriented scales. And I think an important piece here is who are the stakeholders in this assessment? And oftentimes it's more than just the patient. It's more than just you and the patient. It might go on to the patient's friends and family, the patient's employer, the funders, perhaps litigators. Um, you could argue even, you know, uh, the community at large, um, if we're especially here in Canada, we've got publicly funded health care, that everybody has a stake in treating pain. I mentioned this idea of triangulation, and I'm, again, I'm going to come back to this a little bit as we go today, so let's make sure we're familiar with what I'm talking about. Some of you will be familiar that if you have your cell phone, um, usually your phones can sort of guess where you are, not through your GPS, but through this idea of triangulation, which basically says how close you are to different cell towers. Right? So if you look up, we've got lots of cell towers here in London, that if we only have a single cell tower, so if my phone can only see a single cell tower, the best I can say do is say, you know, I know I'm within, I don't know, let's say, two kilometers of this cell tower. I don't know if I'm north, south, east, west, or I just know I'm there. If I can see two cell towers, then we can start to pinpoint a little bit closer, right? And we can say, okay, now I know I'm sort of in this, in this relative area here, but that still may be a bit broad. Triangulation usually requires three, that's the term triangulation, uh, to try and say, you know, okay, now I've kind of pinpointed close to where I am. And it's never perfect, as you know, anyone who's used the, the Wi-Fi location thing, it's, it's usually 100 meters or so. 
but we know, okay, we can see three different cell towers in this case. We sense that you're probably somewhere in this area. Now, the problem here would come if, let's say, two of these cell towers said you're in this area, but the third one said you're over here. Okay. That's sometimes what we run into with clinical pain assessment. What we're hoping for is that our different tools all give us results that kind of make sense, that all sort of lead us to a particular direction we can start to pinpoint what's happening with this patient. So that's this idea of triangulation. And one of the questions on the Google Moderator platform had to do with, you know, what's the best tools for trying to explain to perhaps a funder or some kind of third party what's happening with your patient? And I would say there isn't one. There probably isn't even two. But if you can start to use three or four different tools and all of them are somewhat congruent, then you're actually starting to triangulate sort of what this, this experience may be. That probably is, a, is the best um, approach you've got to explain to people, yeah, yeah, this actually makes sense. And we talk about how we triangulate some of these things going forward. Okay, so you've seen, so this is the idea, right? So cell tower A, B, and C, I'll say, here's where we see the person. We put this all together, we can figure out roughly where the person is. Beyond triangulation, I'm going to give you, I'm going to pitch you one more thing. Oh, I see my little Jenny down there is uh, on the second line. This is a radar plot, and I like to use this just as a sort of a teaching tool. What I've done here is I've put some of the different aspects or domains of the pain experience around the outside of this. Nociceptive, peripheral neuropathic, so neuropathic pain referring to pain from an actual damaged nerve. Central, I've termed it neurogenic, centrally facilitated, centrally mediated, there's different words there. Still referring kind of to the, the nervous system though. Social and environmental aspects. Emotional aspects and cognitive aspects. Now I think it's just worth, first of all, quickly drawing the distinction between the two. I'm sure some of my OT contingent can probably do this better for me. Um, when I'm trying to look at the, the distinction between emotional aspects of pain and cognitive aspects of pain, does anyone know what I'm, how, where, where that distinction is? It goes sort of broadly within the psychological domain, but what's the difference between those two? I hazard a guess. What are cognitions? Compared to emotions. Okay. Thoughts versus feelings? Thoughts versus feelings, yeah, that's probably a good, a good way to put it. Right? We can capture cognitions, basically beliefs, attitudes, thoughts, that sort of thing. We're not really talking about, you know, psychopathology or anything like that here, right? They're usually just, you know, you're somewhere on the continuum of fear or catastrophizing or something like that. The emotion we're talking about happiness, sadness, we might be actually trying to diagnose a clinical condition, depression, generalized anxiety, something like that. So, so that's, your, that's your difference that we're, uh, we're going to keep in mind. But what you can do here is as you start to go through your assessment, and over the course of the day we're going to talk about ways to tap each of these, you may be able to actually start to pinpoint on this little radar plot sort of where, where the biggest window is, if I go back to my initial house analogy. Right? Where's the biggest window for me to kind of jump through and start getting to the inside of this problem? So here's an example where, um, you know, I'm not seeing many signs, you know, peripheral neuropathic, I'm not real convinced that that's a problem. Essentially, I'm not seeing really any weird sort of signs of central facilitation. Uh, the social environmental context doesn't seem to be a big problem. Um, I'm not seeing any massive emotional flags. Eh, the cognition, cognitive flags are a little bit higher, but probably not enough for me to really worry too much about right now but the nociceptive aspects. This is somebody who's got more of a nociceptive problem. That might be someone where, say for example, your, your hands-on treatments, your therapeutic modalities, things like that, would probably, probably be a good place to start for this patient. On the other hand, here's a different patient. And certainly as you get into more and more complex problems, you're gonna see this more commonly, um, where you know, we've got some signs of some peripheral neuropathy there, um, some signs even of central sort of facilitation, yeah, the social environmental context is still pretty good, which even that is not necessarily realistic all the time. Um, a little bit on the emotional side, really strong on the cognitive side perhaps here. In this case, this may be a patient where I'm going to actually start, you know, my, my biggest window to jump through is the cognitive side. And I'm going to, okay, you know what, if I don't address perhaps these sort of maladaptive beliefs about pain, then no matter how much hands-on, how much exercise, how much bracing or splinting I do, we're still not going to address the real issue here. 
So I, I kind of keep this sort of inside my head. When I'm doing an assessment, uh, this is the kind of sort of framework that I think about. And at the end of the day, after I've collected all of these different um, tools, I usually will go through um, after the patient's left, in fact, and I'll go through and say, you're going to just give me a bit of time. I want to I want to digest this a little bit. I want to look through this, and I'll get back to you. Um, and I'm going to and figure out sort of where that biggest window is. And again, if I see sort of problems that aren't, you know, the biggest problem isn't necessarily most accepted right off the bat. If it's some of these other things, they often need to be addressed first. You know, from the beginning. Um, so as far as triangulating pain, as I'm, we're going to try and use some tools that tap some of these different domains of the experience. Um, I'm going to say that uh, your decisions regarding treatment and all these sorts of things really should be based on results from more than one tool. I'd like to see you use uh, more than one tool. Accurate localization may be impossible right off the bat. In that case, you know, you reevaluate on the second day. Are you getting similar kinds of results? That, again, is part of your triangulation. It does it still make sense? Um, you may have to switch focus to the functional side rather than the pain mechanism side. So if your assessment, if the result of all of these great assessment tools that we're going to talk about today still don't give you the, the direction that you want to go, you may now need to switch focus to, okay, you know what, what is it you can't do? And let's try and address that. If I can't, maybe address the pain off the bat. And I will make this comment as well. Don't be afraid to say, you know, at this time I'm unlikely to be able to help you. But don't just leave them hang. You know, so basically, it, and it certainly has happened to me in the past, where you know, based on the results of this, either the problems that I'm seeing here are beyond my scope as, as a physiotherapist or what have you, or the results of my tools are not giving me any kind of consistent triangulation here. Things are just so all over the place that more skeptical people than I might say this person is sort of lingering or exaggerating the problems. I, on the other hand, might say, based on the results of this, I really don't think there's anything that I can, I can address right now. Not to say there's not going to be something in the future that I can, but first I think you need to get some of these other things taken care of, or you need to, I don't know, you need to work on your own, you need to go to this person or that person, uh, here's a referral, that sort of thing. So don't be afraid, and I know sometimes this is hard for young therapists, um, or young clinicians, don't be afraid to say, you know, at this time, I don't think I'm the right person to help you. But again, have a backup plan. Make sure you say, but you might want to try this or something.